is the event. From brand ambassadors and event staffers to magicians and presenters, it's the one and only podcast to introduce the faces in and around the trade show and events industry. And here's our host, Scott Tokar. Hello and welcome to the very first podcast of Face the Event. My name is Scott Tokar. I'm your host, your your tour guide through the world of trade show events and brand ambassador activations. Um, The purpose of this podcast and the reason we call it Face the Event is to show you the faces, the people, the, the personalities that are out there in the trade show events and brand ambassador world. Each one of our podcasts has three sections. The first section is our subject. This will be a timely or important subject that's going to help you do your job, maybe get some tips out of of the mouths of the, the people that are actually in the industry. The second part, the middle part of our podcast, is our interview section. This is our face to face interview. This is where you get to know the people that work in the industry, kind of hear where they've been, where they're headed, and uh, maybe get some tips out of uh, their experience as well. And then we close out each week with a facepalm. A facepalm is um, that embarrassing story, maybe that uh, funny story that, you know, all the people in the industry tell each other when we uh, let our hair down and kind of uh, talk with one another. I can't believe this actually happened. Facepalm. It could have happened to you, could have happened around you, but these are the fun ways to close out the show. I hope you enjoy what we're headed for. Uh, Let's start the show with our very first subject. And this is an appropriate one. Exhibitor badges. How do you get your badge? What are the tips? Here we go. Badges and check-in. Sometimes really easy, sometimes very lengthy. Check-in can be really long or really short, depending on which line you go to. And I've been to the wrong line and waited and then they say oh just go down there so checking into the show and getting your exhibitor badge um it may go quickly or you may have a huge line and it could be difficult to find where you do that always allow enough time i can't stress that enough if you're scheduled to go in for a rehearsal or first day make sure you give yourself lots of time because the lines could be very long makes me think of long lines and standing in a long line, especially when you're uh, expecting that it's going to be really short on the rehearsal day. Wait in a long line and only to get to the front and they tell you, oh, we can't find you or go over to that line. Um, So it is key that you plan to get there at least 30 minutes early uh, because you just don't know what you don't know. Um, And it could take you 30 minutes by the time you've parked to get to the location, find it, get in line, get through the line, um, and then find your booth. Figure out exactly where you're going, what hall the show is in, what hall the registration is in, because that might be a different one. Uh, you, You really can't allow enough time. Get there early. Ask if there is an exhibitor registration that is different than the attendee registration because normally you're either going to be in the wrong line or the exhibitor registration will be shorter and you'll be able to get your badge and get on the show floor before anyone else. And always have your ID with you. Most shows now do require a photo ID. A lot of times pick up your badge at the airport. You're going to save yourself a lot of time by doing that. Uh, There's always a way if you can't get your badge or you're running late, you just call one of your friends who's already in there. They borrow a badge from someone else in the booth, get you in and you go get your badge later if the line's too long. But um, but make sure that you have a QR code if that's what the client is giving uh, to you. Make sure you allow lots of time. If you're scheduled to go in for a rehearsal or first day, make sure you give yourself lots of time because the lines could be very long. Well, thank you very much. Robin Bell, Veronica Tavelli. Becky Jo Schwartz, Alexis Bays, and Jennifer Canale for sharing their tips on exhibitor badges. Our face for today's show started out as a brand ambassador, a hostess, a badge scanner, an event staffer, and she's advanced her career up the the ladder into becoming one of the most recognized live presenters. Uh, one of the faces in scripted presentations that you're going to see on trade show floors 
all around the world working for companies in all types of uh, verticals. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing how she got started as a trade show staffer and then how she promoted herself from being a, an event staffer to becoming a live presenter. And we're going to talk about ear prompters, the secret of not having to memorize a script for every single trade show or every single presentation that you do. Um, and then we're going to be talking about using your own contracts and getting paid directly by the exhibitor as an independent contractor. Back when I started doing theater style presentations, that is a scripted presentation with a seated audience as a magician, this guest was my magician's assistant. Uh, I saw her out working as a, uh, as a staffer, as a badge scanner, and she was so effective at that that she became part of my team. And uh, today, while we rarely work together, but we see each other on the trade show floors all the time, working in countries, in cities, all over the world, and working for many different vertical companies. Without any further ado, here's my good friend, Veronica Taveldi. All right, so my guest today um, is someone that I've known for a really long time. Uh, when we first met, she was uh, predominantly doing um, hostessing, badge scanning, uh, working in trade shows uh, in that capacity. And through the years, she's really become one of the um, eminent um, speakers on the trade show floor. She's one of the folks that you see gathering a crowd and talking about a product, that kind of thing. And I thought perhaps we would introduce to you uh, a dear friend of mine, Veronica Tavelli. How are you today, Veronica? I'm good, Scott. How are well, you? Welcome to uh, Face the Event. Oh, um, do you remember your very first trade show? Uh, I do. Mm -hmm. so tell me about it. What, what, what happened on your very first trade show? Let's see. I really didn't know much about trade shows. I was a lot younger. I was hired through an agency, and I lived in California, so I drove to downtown LA, parked, went in, and didn't know anything about who I was working for. I was just given the booth number, and it was Disney Interactive, and I got to work with Buzz Lightyear and Woody, and then Michael Eisner, who was the CEO at the time, was in the booth and came over and chatted with me, and I had no idea who he was. I just convinced him to come into our booth. Well, that's that's funny. Uh, and and then after that, how did you get that gig? Did you get it through an agency, or that did was you? Through, that was through an agent that I worked for in California. And then back in the day, they didn't call you. You had a list of shows that you could work, and they would mail it to you, and you would circle the shows that you wanted to work, and then mail it back to them. Hmm. <laughs> wow. And, and, um, and, and how did you find that agency to work with? Uh, that agency, I had met a lady in the town that I lived in and was talking to somebody, I believe in a store, and she came over and introduced herself and gave me her business card and said, you know, give me a call if you're interested in doing some promotional type work. So and, I did. And, and was that, were you looking for work predominantly that was close to home at that time? Or were you looking to travel? What was, what was the, the, the motivation? At time, well, at that time I had two little boys, so I didn't really want to travel a lot. What I did is I was able to have my home base and go to Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, places like that. Then I started getting into uh, going to Vegas because there's so much work there met a little network of girls and we would drive over there, share a hotel room. It was a lot of fun. So um, I, you, it really, you kind of expanded where you were and you kind of made a, a career out of it. Um, I did. I did. But, but now you also uh, had, a, had a secondary career going on at the same time. Weren't yes. you a flight attendant at that time? Yes, I was. Now, and I was able to fly and have the benefits and it's real flexible. So mostly I was doing trade shows. Not so, but much. as a flight attendant, you, it really is easy to open up other locations to work too, because um, often you can do something called flying non-rev, huh? You can, however, it's frowned upon to do that. So I didn't do that. I okay. either had the clients pay for my ticket or I would buy it on my own and know that if I went and worked for a client one time with my own expense, that 99% of the time, 
they would be happy and hire me back. And I'd say, I need all my expenses paid. That makes sense. But also, I guess the problem is that if you wanted to cheat the system and, and fly non-rev, there's always a possibility of not making it to your destination at the time that you were oh, expecting. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, so that, that wouldn't be the, the best thing, I guess. No, um, no. And it, it was something that I never would do because yeah. I knew I needed to be somewhere. Sure, there's like delays and things like that, which you can't help. But uh, I always made sure I could get there. Now, obviously, um, when when we we first met, um, I think I had hired you through an agency, didn't you did. I? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and uh, and then you had said uh, that that hey, there was a possibility of of helping me as a magician's assistant, and right. at some time later, we were able to uh, to make that happen, and right. Uh, right. and you were kind of my the girl that I cut in half for quite a yep. while. Yep, and that was a lot of fun. It I miss was, it. I actually oh, miss it. Do you? It was. It's still fun for me to do. Um, but if ever you want to be cut in half, I can. I can help you out. Uh, you uh, gave me a half sister. Yes. The yes. It's not. Uh, not now. You have two half sisters. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, so, um, what do you like about the the trade show world? What what uh, is it? Something that you really love to do, or is it just something that kind of gets you by? Well, at this point in time and life, I never expected it to be a career, which I keep thinking that it could end at any time. And luckily, I kept getting calls and getting rehired and friends would recommend me. Kind of it became a little network. It's definitely when you say to somebody, you work at trade shows or conventions, they kind of get the idea that you're standing on a car in a swimming suit, but it's nothing like that. It's corporate. It's challenging. I've learned a ton about products that I didn't even know existed, like, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, like bingo chips, an event for bingo, something that's a little bit different, uh, all the way to machine tools. A lot of the things I still have no idea what I talked about. But <laughs> So you actually worked a client that mm-hmm. was selling bingo chips. Yeah, it was an event for like gaming and they provided the little bingo chips and right. markers. Wow. Never thought about wow. Somebody's going to do that. I should do a whole um, show just about the, the craziest clients we've ever worked for in trade sure. shows. Now, sure. are you only doing trade shows? Do you do other events, other activations and things as well? Uh, activations meaning? Like, uh, have you ever done any brand ambassador work, like um, uh, representing a product like at a, at a store or... or out, out in the general public, not not necessarily in the trade show realm? Uh, I have done things outside of the trade show events, sales meetings, and I got into the country music event scheme and did the Future Farmers Association, that kind of thing, introducing their live events that are coming up, kind of a little bit of a different catch. Also worked on the news, which I got some experience of live TV, which is kind of like live trade shows where you never know what's going to happen and you just have to roll with it. So let, let's, uh, let's start at the beginning. What were your, what were your duties? Because I want to get into the, 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 the fact that you're on, on ear often and, and, and doing you know, the, the, the presenting part of it. But let's sure. go back to the, to the hostess and the badge scanning and all that kind of stuff. What were your duties back then? And, and, and you know, tell me about that life. Uh, real quick. That life would be going up to anyone and everyone that pretty much had a pulse and getting them to scan your badge. And I've realized over the years that you don't say, can I scan your badge? You say, let me scan your badge. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit softer, you know, and for every, I don't know, 200 people that you scan, you may have five that no, no, but pretty much everybody's pretty agreeable. I would scan badges. For you, one of my first clients, my job was to get everybody to sit down. And uh, as I would say, butts and seats. And make sure that everybody knows when it's going to start, what the prize is, what the giveaway is, what they're going to be watching, and why they want to sit down. And then, um, obviously, you're a great... I, I have to say that you are one of the best networking kind of people I've ever bumped into. Um, I guess, I guess the, 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 
good thing about working with me in the past is that, you know, I didn't mind if you were handing out your business card and getting connections with, with people and that kind of thing. The agencies might frown upon that. Um, sure. But, mm -hmm. but because you were kind of in business for yourself, it kind of led you to build up your own clientele and, and yes. that kind of thing. Yep. yep. And like now, 99%, well, maybe 96% of the clients that I work for are repeat clients. And a lot of them are just referrals from friends. And I, the people that I know on the trade show floor for 20 plus years, they're really in demand. And so if they have set a conflict, they'll recommend me. And I have a certain group of people that I would recommend. Um. That's very true. I mean, uh, you've probably seen uh, from episode to episode of Face the Event that, that we're kind of like a family out there on the trade show yeah. floors, and yeah. we really do know each other. And when we see a yes. newcomer, often we'll walk up to them and give them a little tip or something like that. Right. Um, but um, we kind of get to know who's out there doing those shows over and over again. Sure. Sure. So when did you finally get into doing the speaking part of it? The speaking part of it kind of came naturally. I was in speech in high school and in college. And as my kids say, I was a nerd. But I learned how to stand in front of people and talk about products. Then from that, my one of my first jobs was going to a big sporting goods chain uh, called Sport Chalet. And I went in to all the buyers. Sometimes I'd go to the Vegas show and pitch their clothing line for a company called Marker. And I learned how to sell, how to uh, convince people to sit down and why they want to buy this jacket or these gloves. So I learned a lot about that. And then I noticed one time when I was at a trade show and I was actually working as a hostess slash model. And there was a girl and she was standing there and she was rattling off stuff. And I was pretty impressed how she knew all that. And she was about my age. Then I learned about the ear prompter. Oh, you, that's a great segue, because I wanted to ask you about the ear. What, what is an ear prompter uh, for those of the, us that aren't initiated in that? Like, a lot of people have absolutely no idea what it is. And what it is, I wish I had mine here to, to show you. But it's a, I use a wired corded piece with a custom earpiece that fits into my ear. And then I put the cord down the back of my shirt and nowadays, everybody uses digital, but back in the day, when a lot of the dinosaurs, as we say, as we started, it was all on analog, like a micro cassette recorder, which they're next to impossible to find now. And you just wear it on your belt, or if you, a lot of the guys would wear a suit, put it in their pocket. You can start it, stop it. You record in your own voice, and no one has any idea that you're listening. So about, uh, two seconds ahead of me. Yeah. So so if you're familiar, if you've seen a a, 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 a teleprompter, something that you'd mm -hmm. look into the camera and read, that's sure. telling you what to say. But right. uh, uh, an ear prompter or a voice prompter is um, mm -hmm. not unlike the little earphone that I have in my ear. If you're watching us on YouTube right now, mm -hmm. and I'm going to show when you mention this ear prompter, I'm going to I'm going to put up my. Uh, ear prompter that I that I use often. Um, I use I like the wired one too. Mine's right. actually I use the on camera audio clarifier. It's normally made for what they call an IFB. It's sure. when you see the newscasters with that clear right. um, uh, mm -hmm. thing going around their ear. That's what I like to use because it's the clear. You also can look like a security guard. Yes, you, you can. It. Yes, you can. There are ones uh, for for gentlemen that are wireless. They mm -hmm. are very tiny, like like an ear, like a like a hearing aid. And then right. you wear an inductive loop, or the nor more current ones are now using Bluetooth uh, mm -hmm. to get up into the the ear. But um, uh, technically speaking, you're already wearing a microphone up to your ear. You might as well put something else in your ear. The, the audience right. doesn't know any different. Why not? Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it works, as you mentioned, in your own voice. So right. you kind of speak back. If you've ever played that that game uh, in, in, in grade school where you repeated something someone said just right. a second behind them, it's playing that game, but, but for real. Right. right. And when I first started, someone had mentioned to me the best way to learn is when you're driving and you're in the car and you're listening to the radio, just repeat back what you hear. So that was kind of a good trick. 
that is a good trick. And you know, there's you can you can practice and play with this even with an Apple EarPods or or uh, or, or a simple headphone and just do it for yourself. Record yourself. Uh, read a, a pa couple pages from a book and then mm -hmm. play it back and, and it back. see if, see yeah. if you can and sound when I show people, When I show people, uh, you know, what the trick is, I don't do that often, but most of the time people are like, oh, wait, no way. I could never do that. I could never do that. And it is. It's really strange. But, you know, we can walk around the trade show floor, and I know you can too. You can tell who's using the ear prompter and, and who's not and who's maybe works for the company and is having a tough time getting out the words where ours are usually flawless. Yeah. The, the for me, it's a very Zen like situation when I'm on ear. Um, I, I, it requires a different kind of concentration. And then after about doing the script 10 times in, you know, in the first day, yep. I, it's not, I'm not even thinking anymore. I can actually sit there and, and think about what I want to do later on that, that day. And the words right. just come out of my mouth convincingly, you know? Right. Right. But the key is to not look robotic so you can throw pieces in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Now, um, the reason you may not have heard about this is because it is kind of a, a secret. Uh, it's not something you want to necessarily tell your client about all the time because no, no. they often think that we spend our time memorizing that script. Yes. And yes. It, that means that we get to charge more because we have this skill. Now, you still have the skill with the ear prompter, but if, if I have a, a customer that asks for a script revision, I'll mm -hmm. often say, well, I need a, a, an hour or two to do that. You know, right. I could sit there and record it right away and probably get up on stage and do it right away. But um, And you come back and they're like, wow, how did you learn that? Exactly. And haven't you had a lot of people uh, that work in the booth, you know, the sales reps and stuff come up to you, you know, especially like day two and offer you a job in sales, want to know what your background is. It's kind of kind of fun that they really believe that you know the products. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, well... If you want to know more about the ear prompter, um, again, I'll, I'll put some pictures into the YouTube link uh, and uh, you can see a little bit more about that. Maybe we'll do a whole show on just ear prompter at some point in time. Yeah. Um, so tell me, where, where have you, you've obviously not just done this locally, you're doing this all over the place. Where, where are you going with this now? Are you traveling a lot? Uh, right now, because of the coronavirus, I oh, haven't been traveling yeah. a where, lot. Where, I, uh, if you're listening to this like a year after the coronavirus thing, do you remember that? Do you remember when we were all like locked down? Well, that's, sure. that's why we're able to get so many of these interviews done right now. Uh, right. But, um, but typically, w w where, where have you been traveling and stuff? Uh, well, like one of the very first times that I went to Europe, I went to Barcelona, and that's kind of a hard place to uh, compare anywhere else. Most of the events I feel like that I've done over the past few years are in Las Vegas. There's just so many events. It's really easy for me to get there. Where I live, which is in uh, Elkhorn, Nebraska, close to Omaha, it's pretty central. I can get to Chicago in an hour. I can get to Houston or Dallas in two hours. Uh, I prefer to stay in the U.S. just with all the travel and the going through customs. I like to go to Europe maybe a couple times a year. Most of the time, I feel like I'm in Vegas or Chicago, and Orlando is a big one as well. Right, 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 right. So, um, what um, do, when you when you're doing this, you're, are you charging for like a full day in order to go out, or are you charging more like on an yeah. hourly kind of rate? Uh, it's a day rate because hourly that could be crazy. Over the years, I've learned tricks that in a contract you'd say it's this amount up to eight hours. You also put in an hour lunch break, and otherwise, if if it was up to the clients, they'd have you there at 7 a.m. and then have you leave after their uh, networking event at 7 p.m. where they don't realize that you're talking nonstop. So I usually try to put a cap on it, and if I was going to travel to a show, I would always try, if possible, to leave in the morning early, get there, and then rehearse the same day, and then I would travel, and then I would pay or charge, I should say, a full day rate for that day, which is travel and rehearsal. For the rehearsal day. Yes. Now, are you are you also um, doing um, like uh, uh, your own contracts and things too? Yes. Yes. Well, if I'm hired 
myself and I'm an independent contractor, then I do my own contracts. And I kind of have a standard one that I use. Once in a while, I'll work through a friend or an agent, and then they usually have their own set of contracts. So how do you how do you handle getting paid? What do you what do you do as as far as that goes? I mean, are you um, uh, taking credit cards or or, or, or what is that? How does that work? Well, going in the past, I was set up as a vendor for some like there was a company that I worked for, and I don't know if I can say the name or not, but I worked probably 10, 12, 15 shows a year. So I was already in their system. So all I had to do is make an invoice and then they would pay me electronically into my checking account 30 days after the show. However, over the years, it seems like it makes a little more sense to ask for half up front because you are usually paying your own expenses and to put out all that money to travel and you know credit card. And sometimes you buy your own flights and they reimburse you. It seems to be a lot of companies are pretty agreeable to giving you a deposit up front. Credit cards, yes. I try to avoid credit cards because it seems like there's a, a pretty big fee. And I've been able to charge back the fee if they insist on using a credit card. Well, I'll give uh, you my secret right there, right now. I, I often, uh, I prefer credit card because um, a lot of times the trade show budget world, um, the trade show coordinator or the, the, the person that's the event, in charge of the event, mm -hmm. they have like an American Express card that they can just like charge things like their carpet or their carpet cleaning, or hey, right. we suddenly need waters for the booth. Right. And and if you can accept a credit card, you right. can get paid right then on the right. trade show floor. If you've got a square reader, they can run their credit card and you're paid before you leave the building. So And through my bank too, they can there's an option where they can hit it and you can do credit card or you can do automatic and it just goes into your account and now PayPal. Right. Everybody's doing that. Right. And I just I just tell them, hey, I, it's gonna cost me three percent. So I'm just gonna right. tag an extra three percent onto there. Sure. And they don't have a problem with that. Nope. So so um, when you look around you at the at how much money these trade show uh, exhibitors are spending um, yeah. just to be at the show, just to mm -hmm. have the carpet, just to have a, an electrical line dropped into their booth. Right. The cost of booth staffers, uh, brand ambassadors, magicians, jugglers, all that, uh, the hosts and hostesses, all of that, it's, it's so little in their price. They have no problems doing just a, just no, a credit card no. kind of and thing. And I know, too, if they get one good lead or one good contact, pays for the whole thing for five years sometimes. Exactly, exactly. So uh, understand your value there, and uh, you... you um, you can ask for, for proper money out there. Right. Um, so where do you see yourself in the future? Are you going to continue speaking and, and um, uh, you know, or, or I mean, because you've been in the business. We, we together have been in the business for a very long time. We have made a career out of this. We have. Yeah. We have. Uh, a lot of people think that maybe this is just a part-time, hey, I'm in college, I'm going to go sure. be a, a hostess or, or a brand ambassador. And that's great too. I mean, it's great money. Uh, mm -hmm. It's amazing how much money you can get paid legally to do something, right. you know? Right. Um, yeah. And if you lived, say, in Vegas and, uh, you know, some of these younger girls are out of college, they're making a couple hundred dollars a day. And I always say the beauty of it is if you go and you work for a client and you don't like them, you don't ever have to work for them again. That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, are you going to continue doing some of this, um, the speaking? Um, is I that, hope so. yeah. yes. And then doing some marketing and, you know, our little network of friends that we're all giving each other ideas. It seems like zoom is really big right now, but you still don't have that personal touch. And with the events, I think it, it really makes a big deal if you have the live talking head there compared to somebody on a big screen. Yeah, live events aren't going anywhere. If you're if you're worried about that or if you saw that there was a lot of Zoom meeting stuff, there's uh, digital fatigue, there's Zoom fatigue, there's uh, uh, a lack of, of, um, of connection there. I mean, it works. It's better than nothing. But sure. I guarantee you, as much as you are dying to go to Disneyland or to the movies or to a bar, people mm -hmm. are also looking forward to being in trade shows and live events again. So right. um, it's not right. just it's not just us in the industry, it's the people mm -hmm. that are visiting that want to be there right. as well. Right. I don't know if we'll be as aggressive because you can't just come right up to people to get them to scan your badge. I think people will be a little bit 
I can't I wait to listen to this interview two years from now because we're gonna it's we're gonna know what's on the other side of that two years from now. Right. right. Um, so if you could give a tip, if you could look back at at Veronica at the beginning of your career, mm -hmm. and you had the knowledge that you have today, is there something you'd want to like advice to yourself in that? The knowledge that I have today and advice to myself. Any tips, any I, tricks, any? Sure. In the beginning, I was very agreeable and a couple times, that, or a few times, if you start out where they want you to do four presentations an hour, pretty much every 15 minutes, and there is no break in between, and I would do it for four days, and at the end, I was exhausted. Knock on wood, I've never lost my voice. However, it's draining. It's You are a performer and it's mentally and physically draining. I think looking back, I would say, you know, if it's a 10 minute or under script, the max amount of times I can do it is if you want me to perform and be my best twice an hour. So um, that's really very good advice. I mean, you're, you're the one that's in control of things. You are looked at as the expert um, yes. the, the, uh, even if you're starting in this business, if, if, if you're, this is the beginning of your, of your path as a brand ambassador, as a booth staffer, a uh, host, hostess, whatever, um, mm -hmm. you probably in many cases have more experience after doing three or four shows than the people that are hiring you. So right. they will right. look to you and you can be the expert right away and let right. them know this is the best way to do it. This is the, this is the way to, to handle it. Right. Or give a little bit of, uh, how would you say, constructive criticism when they're expecting, uh, you know, for an hour and they want the seats filled, every single seat, but yet they have 50 chairs there on opening day at 9 a.m. and everybody is doing their first presentation at 9 a.m. Yes, um, yes. 9.15 or 9.30. So before we go... Um let me ask you, um, has, is there a place that you've been that, uh, that you love, that you, you, know, you, you can't wait to get back to? Where have you, uh, where have you traveled to that you know, really made an impression on you? I mentioned earlier that the uh, first time I went to Europe was Barcelona. That's kind of a hard one to compare to, and I've probably been there 10 times. It feel, I feel like trade shows go on a cycle. Maybe go to Copenhagen a lot. And then the next, it's, everything's in London. Maybe everything's in Paris. I would say my favorite place was Barcelona. I would love to go back there. I also had a really good experience in Austria, in Vienna. It was like, twist my arm. It was June. It was beautiful. The weather was nice. You could stay out after the show. They had sand in the city where you're in the middle of the city and people have it like a beach right across from the convention center. It was wonderful. So, you know, not only can you make a career out of this, but you can really have a whole lot of fun too. If you like oh, to travel, yeah. if, you are, if you're a people person, um, you know, there's more reasons than just the money to get into this right. career. Right, right. Well, Veronica, I- to bring my family too. Sometimes oh yeah, you can once in a while, especially yeah. if you're traveling a lot. You can you can have the the miles too uh, sure. to 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 put sure. them on the plane with you, and, and they and can the, stay in the hotel while you're working. The and hotel's go out already paid floor. for. It. Why not? Exactly, That's right. exactly. That's right. Or. If you travel as much as I do, you can be on uh, uh, on Southwest. You can bring your companion with a companion pass. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, so. you can. So, well, anyhow, Veronica, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us today. Um, it's sure, it it's fun. good to hear some of the tips and tricks from the from the real pros that have made a career out of uh, trade shows, and uh, and and certainly you're someone that I respect and 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 love seeing thank out you. there on the trade show floor. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Now, we like to end our show every week with uh, what we like to call a face palm. A face palm is something that's embarrassing or uncomfortable or just something you couldn't believe that you saw out there in the events or trade show industry. Now, this could have happened to you personally or maybe it happened to somebody else, but it's a story that uh, generally is told when you're out on the road talking to other staffers and saying, I can't believe this happened. Today's facepalm is from our friend, Robin Bell. Okay, so for me, this was a um, one of many facepalms. Uh, this was years ago. Uh, I was working with another presenter at a show, and we had a large audience. 
seats on one side, seats on the other aisle down the center. And there was a, a young gentleman in a wheelchair, and he wanted to sit up front. We had crowd gatherers who moved him to the front row, took one of the chairs out, and put him in the front row. At this particular uh, show, during the presentation, we would throw out t-shirts. And we'd throw out, you know, maybe 12 or 14 of them, and then we did a big drawing at the end. I threw out a t-shirt to the gentleman in the, in the wheelchair, and he put it underneath his wheelchair. And he was on the aisle. A guy comes down the aisle on his hands and knees, reaches under the wheelchair, pulls the t-shirt out, and attempts to leave. And I said, stop. Stop. Wait a minute. I said, give him back his t-shirt. I said, apparently 100% cotton is more important to you than your dignity. I will give you a t-shirt if you come up here and do the chicken dance. He came up to the stage, he did the chicken dance, I gave him a t-shirt and I told him, you are a very good sport, but you know, 100% cotton, what they'll do sometimes is very funny. Thanks, Paul. Well, that about wraps up our show for this week. Our inaugural podcast is now in the bag and we've had a great time chatting with our friends and learning a little bit about the event and trade show industry. I hope that you're going to join us next week. Remember, you can see us on YouTube or download our podcast anywhere podcasts are available. Please tell your friends. Hopefully you can build up a good uh, group and uh, really help this podcast go along. My, again, my name is Scott Tokar. Have a great week.